Hello lovely people, today I am sort of coming at you with the second half of my Christmas book haul video. I was very kindly gifted a lot of book tokens for Christmas and then I also just bought books with my own money. I've got a lot of books to talk about so I'm just kind of going to go into it. No more preamble. Sophie vlogs. To kick things off, I did take advantage of the Waterstones online sale. I didn't do the in-person hardcover sale because I'm not really going to shops at the moment, but I did take advantage of the heavily discounted online one. So um, let's just go for it. I've got Six Crimson Cranes by Elizabeth Lim. I really, really love these covers. I'm going to put the name of the cover designer in the description down below because they are a big favourite of mine, but I want to double check that it is the right person that I'm thinking of before I like shout it out, so that'll be in the description down below. Um, I've been really interested in reading Elizabeth Lim for a while. This is a YA retelling of a Japanese myth. It kind of reminds me a little bit of um, the... there's an Irish myth that Juliette Marillier's Daughter of the Forest is based off of, and they sound quite similar where um, in this case our main character, her brothers, are turned into cranes and she has to sort of like undergo these trials in order to save them. In Daughter of the Forest it's that she's not allowed to speak. In this one I think she, um, she gets like an acorn put on her little head. Essentially she has to like embrace the magic that she has always tried to distance herself from and um, there's something about her being like betrothed to this prince that, doesn't want, that she doesn't want to marry and she's going to have to trust him, that kind of a thing. I've heard really good things about this, specifically um, Jade at Jade Juniper included this in her um, top books of the year video, so um, I'm very excited. Uh, I also picked up Daughters of Sparta by Claire Hayward. This follows Clytemnestra and Helen. I'm having a real Greek myth retelling revival. I feel like I went off of it for a little bit. I did classical studies at university, um, got really, really into like Greek myth, Greek myth retellings, and then I feel like I sort of like had a little time where I wasn't so interested. And then reading Natalie Haynes's Pandora's Jar has really like brought it all back to me. And Helen is a figure that I think a lot of Greek myth retellings do really dirty. I think that like a lot of Greek myth retellings that are like so say with the aim of like giving a voice to voiceless women from literature and stuff like that, I feel like some of them still fall into this like demonising Helen trap. Like I'm thinking of the Penelope ad specifically. <laughs> Um, so I, I really want like retellings that explore Helen in like a nuanced way and I'm really hoping that that's what this is going to give to me. We'll see. Also in that sale is one of my most anticipated books of 2021 and that was The Transgender Issue, An Argument for Justice by Sean Fay. I really like non-fiction queer books and specifically like living in the UK at the moment is a little bit of a hellscape for many reasons but one of them is the media's relentless persecution of trans people and I've heard nothing but great things about this book and I'm hoping that this is going to be one that is really illuminating for me to read but then also that I can recommend to a lot of people going forward. I also got two non-fictions that kind of explore like some kind of art from history. The first one is Hidden Hands, The Lives of Manuscripts and Their Makers by Mary Wellesley. I have a, my calendar for 2022 is Illuminated Manuscripts. <laughs> because they're just beautiful. I didn't know that this book existed before the sale, but this is absolutely my cup of tea, and I'm really looking forward to learning more about, like, I know, like, a bit about illuminated manuscripts, but, like, I'm ready to have my mind blown. And then following on from that is Fabric, The Hidden History of the Material World by Victoria Finley, which is a history of the world through fabric. Specifically, um, from looking at the contents page, like the chapters are different types of fabric, so like bark cloth, tapper, cotton, wool, tweed, etc. And I love these, like, textile history is fascinating, and I like it when it's organised, kind of like, like in this way is organised by, like, um, type of textile. I read uh, The Golden Thread by, literally behind me, I don't know, it'll be in the description down below, but I read The Golden Thread and that was like tracing history through specific types of fabric, so like the importance of wool to Vikings to make their sails, stuff like that. So very, very excited. And then the final book I got from the Waterstone sale was um, Matrix by Lauren Groth. Um, I didn't initially get this one and then I went back and did a second order and got it because it really stayed with me. Because um, we follow, this is focused on Marie de France who is a historical figure that I would like to read more of her like actual writings. I'm pretty sure she's like 12th century um, in France. And like The Lays of Marie de France is a book that is like I want to read. But 
this is not I, my understanding is this is not the book to go to if you want to get like an understanding of Marie de France's life because it skims over like her actual writing da -da, and all that kind of stuff like it, that's not really what this is focused on but I know that it's like her life in the monastery after she's been like exiled from the French court and I know that it's sapphic and I don't know in what way but I'm intrigued and I just there's something about like sapphic nuns and then also like contemplative writing I don't know this one just really intrigues me and then I bought another book kind of based on that despite the fact that these are very different books but I also got Unknown Language by Hildegard of Bingen and Hugh Lemmy this is on my radar because of Anna Maria actual spinster and this is like a sci-fi kind of I like Hildegard of Bingen is a real person who wrote a bunch of like spiritual writings again she was like in a convent um and was very learned and that kind of thing and this is taking her writings but then also <laughs> like making a very like sci-fi narrative out of it like Hildegard's tale is received in the plague year of 2020 by Alice Falls and then in the next century in a sea cave with cracked amethyst walls on planet Avaz once known as Earth Banu Kapil's Pinky Agawalia finds fragments of a beautiful codex Lingia Ignota, Hildegard's unknown language, bears seeds of renewal for a world in flux. I don't know what this is going to be like, but I'm so interested to discover. <laughs> Moving on, I also picked up this lovely edition of Under Milkwood by Dylan Thomas, which is a Solo Society edition. It has this beautiful cover, and we also have, like, illustrations. Um, I have read Under Milkwood, and also recently I watched the film adaptation with... Chris Evans? Yes. And that was a really interesting adaptation. This is one that, um, the first time I read Under Milkwood, I read it for Dewey-thon. Um, I will link below my wrap-up for that if you'd want, like, my actual review of it. But the, the one thing I, I really loved about it was, like, the rhythm of the words and, like... <laughs> I read this in the fields near where I work, like, walking around the fields, like, occasionally reading it aloud to myself, probably looking a bit weird, but it's because, like, it's, like, the sound of it, even if you take away, like, what is it about, but, like, the sound of the the whole piece, it's just, like, beautiful. So I really, I found that film, ad film adaptation really interesting to see how they had, like, done it, and then um, I'm trying to get like books that I don't own I'm trying but I like I'm trying to find like nice editions of so um I saw this second hand and I just thought it was lovely and so now I now I own it and I can do like a reread the rest of these are in such a random order I'm just going to pick up what's on top of the pile and tell you about them that's the only way to do it so I have a little tiny penguin classic that's three Tang Dynasty poets um, which are pastoral lyrical verse evoking the rural landscapes and peoples of 8th century China from three of its finest poets. I don't think I know any Chinese poets, so hoping to expand that somewhat. Um, I also have Small Beauty by uh, Jia King Wilson Yang, which is on my radar. I also think this is on my radar because of Anna Maria Actual Spinster. <laughs> such a hashtag influencer on my life. <laughs> this follows May, who is coping with the death of her cousin, and she, like, abandons, like, her big city life to go to, like, a more rural location. And while there, she learns about this secret relationship that her aunt has been having, and she also is, like, reflecting on trans women in her life. I just, I'm, again, everything that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to be like, I'm really intrigued, but I am. <laughs> Um, and then I also have The Last Quarter of the Moon by Xi Zhan, which is on my radar because of um, Unicorn. I will link all of these people down below. <laughs> this follows an old woman who is a member of the Avenki tribe, um, which is like a nomadic group in northern China, and she's just sort of like reflecting on her life. And I thought that this sounded like a really interesting, potentially peaceful narrative, because it's, it's sort of like her, she's like bearing witness to the history of her tribe, but also like the changing history of China. Next up is The Yield by Tara Jean Winch. This is uh, written by an Indigenous Australian author, and we are following um, this old Indigenous Australian man who um, is trying to preserve his language before he passes away, but then he does pass away, and then we follow his granddaughter who has come back for his funeral. But the land that they live on is um, in threat by a mining company, 
and she wants to try and stop this threat. So I imagine this is going to be a lot about like language and preserving language, but then also like indigenous land rights, that kind of thing. I've never read a book by an indigenous Australian author before. Um, I think this sounds really beautiful and fascinating. So I'm very much looking forward to diving into this one soon. Then I have Wizard of the Crow by Nguguiwa Siongo. I'm just going to read you a bit of the back. This is set in the fictional Free Republic of Aburia. Wizard of the Crow dramatises with searing humour and piercing observation a battle for control of the souls of the Aburian people. Um, I, uh, he's on my radar because I wanted to read uh, Weep Not Child by him because I know it is considered a classic. I know that a lot of his work is drawing on a lot of the politics of Kenya and then often reconfiguring it into like a fictional narrative but in a way that is like drawing parallels with Kenyan history. Um, I just decided to go for this one because I saw it secondhand on Oxfam and I was like this is an author I'm interested in exploring. If I like this then I can go forward and explore more of his work but um, it's a bit of a trunker so I will be interested to see how I get on with it but I'm very interested to just like dive in and give it a go. Next up is Leilani of the Distant Sea by Erin Entrada Kelly. Um, this is drawing on Filipino um, mythology and folk tales, I believe. We follow Lilani, who is put in a very difficult position. Her mother has fallen in, her stepfather and stepbrother are really horrible. And essentially, she just like has to go on a journey. She like gets in a boat and she goes on this journey. And my understanding is that this is really about like choosing yourself and that kind of thing. And I love middle grade, where the message is all about like finding oneself, claiming one's identity, that kind of thing. So I'm ready to kind of be emotionally destroyed by this book. Next we have a book that my partner was thinking of getting rid of, so I have claimed it as my own for the time being, and that's The History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. This is, is called The History, but there is a lot of this that is just like entirely made up. It's sort of, in my mind, I compare this slightly to like Herodotus, where it's like, some of these observations are true, but a lot of them are just invented by you. <laughs> but um, I'm interested in this because I've been doing like my Arthurian reading, and um, I like he. I'm interested in like the parts of this that are exploring like the idea of Arthur and Merlin and that kind of thing. Then there is a sequel that I'm really excited to read. This is The True Queen by Zen Cho. This is the sequel to Sorcerer to the Crown, um, which is a book that I gave it four stars when I read it, but it's really stayed with me and I definitely think it's up there in my favourites. And Zen Cho is an author that I've really enjoyed exploring further. So um, Sorcerer to the Crown was set in this like Regency world where there is magic and we followed Zacharias who was the first black sorcerer royal and then also uh, her name begins with P I've already forgotten it um, who was she was like a lower class woman who had magical powers and it was doing a lot of like um, exploring class and race dynamics while telling you this like magical fantastical tale to do with like fae and magic and sorcery and that kind of thing. So I won't go into detail on what this is about because I don't want to spoil anything from the first book but it kind of branches off and it is following some people who are re like tangentially mentioned in the story because of a different figure's presence but we're actually following their story in more detail in this one which I'm really intrigued by. Then we have Love After Love by Ingrid Persaud. She is a Trinidadian author and I believe this is on my radar because of Sajid at... I cannot remember anyone's YouTube handle right now but I will link them down below also. This is like a familial relationship repercussions kind of novel. Like it's mentioned in the blurb. Um, da -da -da -da. The home is the place keeping these three safe from an increasingly dangerous world until the night when a glass of rum, a heart to heart and a terrible truth explodes the family unit driving them apart. So I'm imagining that this is like a lot of like family drama and family relations and like hidden secrets and that kind of thing. I am super intrigued. But I have Homegoing by Yara Jassy. To be honest with you, I've just heard so many good things about this book continually that I was like, Sophie, at some point you need to pick it up and then I saw it second hand and I was like, this is that point. I know that we follow these two sisters who are separated and then um, one of them um, is enslaved and one of them becomes the wife of a slave trader and then we follow them and their descendants through the generations to see how their um, lives diverge. I mean I've heard amazing things about this so I'm sure it's going to deliver. After that is a beautiful book. This is The 450 from Paddington by Agatha Christie. I am collecting these particular editions of Agatha Christie. I think they are stunning. They have these like end papers that are beautiful. I just think they're gorgeous. What I know about this one is that 
um, there is a murder, someone dies on a train, and they think it's all legit, except for this woman who was on a different train, like, saw something happen when the trains pass each other, and then, like, unraveling from there. At this point, I like these additions so much that every now and then I buy one for myself, and it's just like a treat, and I go in not- I don't really need to know a lot about Agatha Christie books before I read them anymore, because I just know that I'm gonna have a great time. This one is, um, The Last Days of New Paris by China Mieville. I am so intrigued by this. This is an author that I've been meaning to read for a while. This is set in 1941 during the French re French resistance in World War Two, and like it's mixing like surrealism and sort of like time loops because um, we're following someone who is in the resistance, but then like he, this guy unwittingly unleashes something, and then it flashes forward in time, and like Paris is still stuck in this like particular time it's all very weird and like I know sometimes I'm like oh sometimes things are like too weird for me I'm kind of hoping that if I just go in and embrace the weirdness I'll have a really interesting time reading this. Next we have like a multi-generational sort of tale this is The Mountain Sing by Nguyen and San Khe Mai this is um exploring Vietnamese history so I believe it starts uh yeah 1972 so it starts during the Vietnam War um but essentially this is compared on the back to like pachinko and so i'm expecting a novel that kind of goes down through the generations and we're just sort of like exploring this family and what is happening to them whilst also exploring vietnamese history and speaking of pachinko <laughs> i also picked up pachinko because i read this on kindle and i really really liked it and i'm trying to like when i really really like a book i'm trying to like buy it if I don't already own it so that not all of the books I'm buying are new to me but I am actually like filling my shelves with books that I know I love already. So um, uh, Pachinko is a multi-generational tale that follows this Korean family who um, move from Korea to Japan and then um, we get to see stuff like um, the events of like World War II, like coming up to more contemporary times. Um, I really really liked Pachinko, I liked that it kind of felt like it was exploring like the randomness of fate and how like sometimes you're in the wrong place at the wrong time but sometimes you're in the right place at the right time and you can't really control that. Um, yeah, I thought that this was really beautifully done so um, I thought I'd get myself a physical copy of it. I also have This Is Vampires, Lord Byron to Count Dracula by Christopher Frayling which is just like a compendium of like vampire writing and like um, essays upon vampire writing and I've been exploring like Dracula retellings so I just thought why not see what this can give me? <laughs> then we have another book that I've technically already read before, and this is The Animators by Kayla Ray Whitaker. I don't remember this one very well, but I rated it, I gave it a four stars when I first read it, and this was in the Waterstone sale, it was like three pounds, so I thought I would give it another go. I remember that it is queer, I remember that they are animators, and, um, but I remember it being quite gritty and real, like it explored like one of their like drug addictions, and just sort of like their life. So I thought I would give it another go, reread it, and remind myself of like why I seemed to like it quite a lot the first time I read it. A uh, book by an author who I know that I definitely like, This Is Hard Times by um, Jodie Taylor. This is the second book in the Time Police series, which is an offshoot from the Chronicles of St. Mary's. Chronicles of St. Mary's is like time traveling historians. The Time Police series is um, the Time Police who are in charge of like maintaining um, the stability of timelines. But the crew that we are following in this in this are sort of like a ragtag bunch. They're like the misfits. But there's a lot of, one thing that I really liked about the first book in this series is that there was a lot of this like re-examination of like, if the time police is going to survive, they're going to have to change. And what will that change look like? And, um, but also these are just really fun. They're very lighthearted. They're very like jokey. I always have a really nice time reading them. My mum accidentally ordered two copies of this book. That's why I own this one. <laughs> then I have A Will to Kill by R.V. Raman. He's an Indian writer and this follows this guy who is very, very rich and he like lives in the mountains and he essentially he leaves two wills and so when he dies it's like if he was murdered this is his will but if he wasn't murdered this is his other will and this gives me um, I saw this in John, on Jen Campbell's channel and she described it a bit as sounding a bit like Knives Out which I watched recently and I really loved so I just thought like I'm enjoying murder mysteries at the moment um, I really enjoyed Knives Out let's give it a crack. After that is The Vanished Birds by Simon Jimenez. This is a science fiction book. We're following the captain of a transport ship who, like, she just lives from, like, paycheck to paycheck until one day she meets this, like, mysterious little boy. He was, like, born with a gift that, like, threatens this massive corporation or something, so she kind of, like, has to, like, take care of him. What intrigued me about this 
was it was something to do with this the spaceship was like alive or something and that's one of my like bookish buzzwords or rather like life buzzwords is like living spaceships or like sentient spaceships um i i've been I felt like I didn't read a lot of sci-fi last year, and then this year I found myself with cravings for sci-fi, so we're gonna like dip our toes into things a bit more. So after that is the Pillow Book by Say Shonagon, which is, oh, what is this particular time? So she lived from 966 to 1017, and this is just like, this is like one of the greatest works of Japanese literature. She lives during the Heian period. I read As I Crossed a Bridge of Dreams by Lady Sarashima. Um, and in the introduction to that book, the translator talked about this book a lot because a lot of people find that the woman who wrote this one is much more like active in her own life. But I really liked uh, As I Crossed a Bridge of Dreams. I felt like it was actually saying quite a lot. And then there was more complexity there than I think maybe my introduction necessarily was allowing for. Um, and so because I really enjoyed reading that one, I thought I would read this one and sort of see a different perspective on the same time period from someone who potentially was more involved in court life than that other woman was. After that is Girls of Riaz by Raja Alsena. This one is also on my radar because of uh, Unicorn, um, because uh, she did a video where she recommended Saudi Arabian literature, or rather she's doing this project where they read, um, each month they read um, books from a different country in Asia, so one month was Saudi Arabian books, and then she talked about this one here. This kind of feels like it is like snapshots of life for a bunch of different women, but um, I know that this was banned in Saudi Arabia when it was released. I don't often read novels that are just like, let's follow a group of women, snapshots of their lives. But I think that this sounds really interesting, so I'm going to give it a go and see what it's like. Then we have Do Not Say We Have Nothing by Madeleine Tien, which is a... Sorry, forgive me if this seems like a buzzword for me at the moment. I believe a multi-generational family tale. This one is exploring the history of a Chinese family. So we go we go from like revolutionary China, we like working our way through history, exploring this particular family. I believe this has a thread of like music and composition and like classical music running throughout it, which is very interesting because I really like classical music, so I'm intrigued by that. This is also one that has been on my Goodreads to read pile for my to reach out for many, many years. And I'm trying to make a conscious effort to actually read the books that I have filed as wanting to read many years ago and this is part of that project. Okay I'm very nearly done with my physical books so um, next up is Diary of a Provincial Lesbian by VG Lee. This is small town life captured. I believe it is very funny. This was written in... oh wow <laughs> I didn't realize it was signed by the author. Goodness Sherry why did you get rid of this? Um, published in 2006. I'm thinking this is going to be like a bit like a comedy based on like provincial English life and so I'm interested to see what that actually is like as a reading experience for me. Then we have uh, Reckoning by Magda Zubanski. Can't remember who put this on my radar. I, it was an Australian booktuber many years ago mentioned that Magda Zubanski is like a comedian and she, it, like her coming out was like a really big deal in Australia and that this is like a really moving novel. Mm -hmm. um, her father was like an assassin in World War II and that really like affected her life growing up, like the, the, the sort of things that he carried with him and then also like her own coming out journey and that kind of thing. Can I remember? I want to say it was someone like Leslie Rickman because she talks, um, she's Australian and I know that I took on a lot of book recs from her when I when she used to post more regularly. Might not be, might be someone else. I don't remember anymore. My final physical book is The Raven Master, My Life with the Ravens at the Tower of London by Christopher Skyf. My friend Mark read this and said it was really, really great. I think The Raven Master seems like a lovely man. I think I watched like a documentary about him before and he just seems really nice. And I think like being the Raven Master must be a really interesting career. Like how do you get into that? What does it entail? I want to find out. Just briefly, I will end on a few ebooks that I also picked up and then I will draw this massive, massive haul to a close. So I picked up Monstrous Design by Kat Dunn, which is the sequel to I literally just read the first book, that's why I bought the second book. Mm, something Remedy, Dangerous Remedy by Kat Dunn, which I read recently, which is set during uh, Revolutionary France. Um, a little bit Six of Crows vibes in that they are trying to pull off like heists, but also very different and its own thing. I had a really fun time with the first book, so I picked up the second book because I'm trying to like read my series 
quicker if the books are out. The Child Queen by Nancy McKenzie, which was on my radar again because of J. Juniper, which is um, following Guinevere and it's like an Arthurian retelling. Usually it's packaged as like the first two books are packaged together as Queen of Camelot, but I thought I would get the first one on my Kindle and see if I like it before I buy like all four of the books. Um, a General Theory of Oblivion by Jose Eduardo Aglusa, translated by Daniel Hahn, which is on my radar because of Books with Lanes. This is starts on the eve of Angolian independence. Um, and we're following this character who like locks themselves in their house. So we're kind of following them just being locked in their house, but like in the background there's lots of Angolan history going on. Um, it's very short, and I think that, that as a setup sounds intriguing. Um, Island of Shattered Dreams by Chantal Spitz, which is translated by Jean Anderson. This is, I believe, the first book written in the native Tahitian language to be published. It's sort of like a family saga, like a doomed love story set against the backdrop of Tahitian history. So, um, never read a book by a Tahitian author before, so that should be interesting. The Tea Master and the Detective by Aliette de Bodard is, um, I have read one book in this sort of universe before, it's a science fiction, it's a sort of Sherlock Holmes retelling, but it's like set in space, and like obviously the detective is going to be our Sherlock Holmes figure, but I really enjoyed, um, I can't remember the name of the other Aliette de Bodard book that I read previously, like Seven of Infinities I think it was, but um, she's written a whole bunch of novels that are in this universe and I really really liked that one, so I'm hoping to explore like all of them eventually. Um, the Heartless Divine by Varsha Ravi. This is inspired by Indian mythology. We follow Suri, who is like the princess of this place. Her family and her kingdom are nearly destroyed, and then the narrative picks up like much later. And she has no recollection. It's it's like she has no recollection of her past lives, and then like shenanigans ensue. The Golem and the Genie by Helen Wecker is um, we follow Chava, who is a golem who has been brought to life by like a disgraced rabbi. But when the ship, like the voyage that they are on, like the ship like sinks, and so Chava arrives, but without this rabbi, and they're sort of like unmoored in life. And then they meet a Ginny, and they kind of just like go through New York together. And I think that sounds like a really interesting setup. Uh, also The Goblin Emperor by Catherine Addison, which I think is on my radar because of Jean at Jean's Bookish Thoughts. And um, the youngest half goblin son of like the Goblin Emperor, like has lived all of his life in exile, and then like his father and then the three people who are in line for the throne like all die, and so then he's like thrust into the role. He's not schooled in the art of politics. He has no friends, and he's just kind of trying to like adjust to this, which I think sounds fun. And finally, Seeds of Hope: Wisdom and Wonder from the World of Plants by Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall is a very famous like. I don't know how what her job role is. <laughs> she got really famous because she went into the rainforest and she like befriended all those gorillas. I mean, she did a bit more than that, but you know, um, she's like a naturalist, like a conservationist, that kind of thing. And this is a non-fiction book that is like her pondering upon like the world and life. And I think that it is hopefully quite hopeful in, but also being like, let's make sure we don't destroy the planet, kind of thing. Um, this feels like an absolutely mammoth video. Thank you for sticking with me if you have remained till this point. I would love to hear if you have thoughts on any of these books, uh, or if you've read any of them. If, if you haven't, like, do let me know. Please leave a comment down below if you fancy it. Otherwise, I'll stop talking. I'll let you go back to your life. And I hope you have a really lovely day. I'll see you next time for something different.